time. Okay, it's me again. Different slide template this time. And actually, a bit of a different presentation. So even though I'm talking about microOS, this isn't Richard, the future technology team member where we work on microOS at SUSE. This isn't Richard, the OpenSUSE chairman, talking about this. Um, this is Richard, the crazy contributor who still just sometimes does weird stuff. Um, uh, in fact, so, you know, it's not official. This isn't like some future OpenSUSE plan unless we turn this into some future OpenSUSE plan. Um, in fact, when, when I originally put this proposal in, um, the, I the idea I had was, I'm going to work on this crazy thing, and Hack Week will have happened at SUSE, um, where SUSE give um, all of R&D a week to play on whatever they want. So, you know, my assumption was Hack Week would have happened by now, and I could talk about my Hack Week project at OSC. Hack Week is in three weeks' time, um, so I haven't done anything. Um, but the session is still here. Um, so I decided to kind of turn this into a bit more of a, a round table, a discussion session. So anything I say as I ramble on for the next half hour or so, feel free to interrupt. Martin has a, a microphone. There's a microphone at the back. You know, there's, yes, there's no script. This is a, this, just like this idea is a construction site. You know, this presentation is a construction site. Let's, yeah, see where we end up afterwards. Um, and yeah, were all of you at my microOS talk an hour ago? Most of you. Okay, good. Just need that because I don't have to kind of repeat half of that then. Um, the basic thing I've been asking myself lately is what the hell to do about the Linux desktop. You know, I want to believe that this is possible someday. Um, you know, because this is one of the reasons why I got into Linux, to use a Linux desktop, to have that be the thing that I am doing my work on, that I'm playing around on, that I do my gaming on. Um, but the, you know, it hasn't happened yet. And even where it does happen, you know, there are, being frank, you know, desktop Linuxes out there that are more popular than OpenSUSE. There shouldn't be, but they are. Um, so I've been kind of thinking of like, what are the problems that are really holding the desktop Linux world back? And there's, there's kind of the obvious easy ones to blame. You know, the fact that there are multiple distributions you know, is part of the issue. You know, but there's lots of choices out there. That means some people are going to pick Ubuntu, some are going to pick Fedora, some are going to pick us, and you know, that makes it kind of hard to kind of coalesce behind this sort of single desktop idea. But then that idea doesn't really fly anymore either, because we're not in this single Microsoft Windows world anymore. You know, people are gaming on Macs, so they're gaming on Android, they're, ga they're playing around and doing stuff on Windows. Hey, they're running Linux on Windows these days. It's, it's you know, the, the, the kind of diversity of options aren't what is, I can't believe that is what's holding desktop Linux back. Um, so, you know, what is? And the thing that, that kind of really hits me is the, the, the lack, well, the fact that I think we as communities typically target ourselves and use stuff that we want to use um, and use it the way we want to use it. Um, so, you know, we end up geeking around in tumbleweed because we like playing with, ba with operating systems and we do all this deep and dirty stuff in the operating system. Um, so we don't want a polished, sanitized environment, let's say, for example, like OS X, where you can't do any of that fun stuff, but then it's really easy to get that one application, dump it on OS X, and, and run. You know, it, it's almost like we're living in totally different worlds. Um, and those worlds are you know, diverging in some respects. You know, we're still doing all this weird, geeky, fast-moving stuff, and you know, you're seeing these platforms like Windows and, and like OS X getting, in some respects, more and more locked down and limited. You know, or in other words, you know, they're doing it wrong. Um, and I, I think there's lessons to be learned from that. Um, and, you know, maybe it's because I'm getting older as well, but 
I don't want to be spending all of my time messing around with my laptop to make it work the way I want it to. It's nice that I can. It's nice that I can get under there and I can play around with the, the drivers and the kernel and stuff. But I just want to have a desktop which boots up and gives me a desktop environment and then I can, you know, dump the applications on top. So, I've, yeah, I've been kind of thinking of what's the, the perfect uh, sort of hybrid of, 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 of uh, that approach. And in my day job lately, I've been working more and more micro S. So, you know, like I talked about earlier, you know, micro S now being best described as a single, uh, single service operating system. So, you know, you deploy it, it does that one thing. You know, what if that one thing is just a desktop. And what if that desktop was a traditional OpenSUSE desktop? So something like, for example, GNOME. So I actually messed around with this uh, two hack weeks ago, so 2017, where you know, we weren't talking about microOS as much. I called it Cubic Desktop, but played with the idea there. And basically, what, which, what I took there was the Cubic installer we had at the time, ripped out the container part, because I wasn't going to do this with containers and installed GNOME using transactional updates. So you, you, know, you install the system, you install, transac you install GNOME with, yeah, I think it was PKG in GNOME, uh, GNOME patterns, reboot, and I had a fully working GNOME desktop, even though it was a read-only root file system. So I couldn't mess around in anything in USR, I couldn't mess around with much in VAR because that was broken at the time. Um, but the, the, operating, the, the basic operating system worked perfectly fine. And it was, reminded me a lot of what you see on like a Chromebook now, where you didn't have to bother about messing around with the packages of the, the, the file system, messing around with too much of the configuration. It's just there. It just works. And then I messed around with the... Uh, at the time, Flatpak, like Flathub had just launched, so I was using Flatpak to install my various different applications on top. And the, the idea was really cool. Basically, the, op yeah, the operating system part worked fine, it booted perfectly fine, it patched perfectly fine. I went through about three or four weeks of, of uh, tumbleweed snapshots, and at no point did anything ever go wrong. It always booted perfectly fine, it always got to the desktop by fine. And Besides the uh, sort of the core GNOME applications, so things like the control panel and, and a terminal, there was not a single application on the system because I was using the basic GNOME pattern for Tumbleweed. So I had to install apps from Flatback. And about 35% of them worked, and the rest of them didn't. Um, because at the time, you know, Flatpak was, was rather broken. But the, uh, the general idea of Flatpak is a relatively good one. Not the, the best in the world, but you know, basically taking this idea of a container, or a container like a Roman, so, you know, a sandboxed application, having that sandbox application run, um, but I, un unlike uh, AppImage or, or sort of other arrangements, you don't necessarily have the application and all of its dependencies bundled together in one single big blob, because then you'd end up with like all these applications being like three or four gig in size, because they just like basically have a mini operating system for every single app. With GNOME, with Flat, with Flatpak, you basically have these runtimes, which are a, a, yeah sandboxed containers full of the libraries that you're going to need for these various ecosystems that we have already in the Linux world. So like with KDE, there's a KDE runtime, there's a GNOME runtime, um, there's an NVIDIA driver runtime. So you know, basically remodeling what we currently do in RPMs into these sort of more globby groups. But these groups are the groups that people care about when it comes to desktop applications. You know, Flatpak is very desktop application orientated which is one of the reasons why I'm still liking it more than, let's say, Snap with Ubuntu, where they've basically just reinvented packaging and created all of the problems we have with RPM and solved none of the problems we have with RPM and made some more issues because it's Ubuntu. Um, whereas, yeah, Flatpak really, from a desktop side, does solve, or does at least model the problem the way a desktop user thinks of the problem, 
Orway desktop developer thinks of the problem. So basically, you're developing an app on Linux now. If you're using a GNOME stack, I can totally see Flatpak being the first thing they're going to expect. You know, because the runtime's there, it's being handled by upstream GNOME, build it, test it, ship it, all in GitLab, because they've already pipelined all of that. And you know, we're still doing our RPMs, but should we? Does it really make sense for OpenSUSE to take upstream GNOME's RPMs, or upstream GNOME's source, and build it again, test it again, ship it again, just so we can say we've given you the desktop app? You know, are desktop apps really our core competency? You know, we're really good at doing operating systems, but the desktop app, it's, you know, we typically just you know, ship it, test it, check it in OpenQA, and do it. Like, <laughs> yeah. The open question I have with this is basically, can we make a whole bunch of problems we have with OpenSUSE just disappear by offloading it to what's already happening upstream with Flatpak and GNOME, for example? And then if it doesn't work out as well as it, co it should, actually contributing. So after this all went horribly wrong, and I wrote this blog post, and I, yeah, said how horribly bad Flatpak was, uh, I did feel a little bit guilty. Um, so I went to Guadec, and I started talking with them. Basically, kind of, we worked through most of the issues that were the root cause of these like, massive breakages. Haven't solved all of them, but the, the team there really have you know, changed their build processes. They're testing things an awful lot more. I don't think they're using OpenQA, despite my best efforts. But they're at least, yeah, the, the quality of Flatpak has been improving. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I'm starting to get more comfortable with the idea of using Flatpak as the main way of delivering applications for my desktop. I don't know if it's going to be perfect. This is why this is a Hack Week idea. I'm going to, you know, I want to try this and see how far it goes, see where it goes wrong. Um, um, and with that, I kind of realized that I, I don't really know what I'm doing with a lot of this stuff. It's been a really long time since I've actually contributed directly to GNOME. Um, because, yeah, I used to be in the GNOME team, I still am in the GNOME team technically at OpenSUSE. I used to package it all you know, there, but, you know, it's moved on since 3.2, which is the last time I packaged it, you know, heavily. Um, and so with, with this idea, I want to kind of see uh, where the world currently is, and if anybody is really interested in this idea, um, what needs to be fixed where? You know, is this something where we need to fix OpenSUSE to be more accommodating for Flatpak? Is this something where Flatpak just really do not know what they are doing, and they need to learn how to build stuff properly, at least from an OpenSUSE perspective? In which case, you know, can we, you know, do we need to look at uh, OBS, for example, building flat packs better, or you know, being part of that ecosystem there, or making things more complicated by you know, doing things alongside it, or the like. Um, and nobody's interrupted me yet. Does anybody have any questions at this point? Will? Looking confused? No? Okay. Go on. No, um, my question would be, how would you um, solve the the kind of the the, the meta packaging? In the, you organize things into the right levels of granularity, and you choose. And how do you choose things with the, the things that actually want people actually want to have together? Is it your selection? Is it uh, you provide a lot of fine grained selections? Then how do you find things? You know, it's the same problem you have with a bunch of RPMs, but it's one level up. Yeah. Well, the, my, I mean, it may be my naive approach, but I mean, when thinking like a modern basic user, like with, you know, an, with a phone or a tablet or a Chrome book, you know, what do you get when you boot that thing up for the first time? You know, you basically get the desktop or, you know, the UI and a handful of basic applications and the thing's pretty useless. You know, besides those basic applications, that kind of core functionality, you know, you're on your own after that point, and then you're going to the, the app store or whatever and downloading everything individually that you want. So the meta, 
the, the idea I'd explore with this is, would it, make, would it make sense for the microOS desktop, for example, to have nothing but microOS, GNOME, maybe a subset of the GNOME applications to kind of give you that basic environment. So those would still be RPMs, and those would still be the traditional, you know, the traditional OpenSUSE stuff. And then from that point, we just say, you're on your own. And you know, using the yeah, flat packs, snaps, or whatever, putting everything on top of that. Yeah, kind of go the sort of long tail approach. That's, that's where I, yeah. Which, yeah. What does anybody else think of that? There we go. Yeah, so I'm trying to compare this with uh, the Mac OS world or the iOS world or Android, Chrome, whatever. In general, I think the basic model, take the OS, make the OS basically one big blob that is updated atomically, works really well. And Tumbleweed gives me a very similar experience to what I see on an iOS where, you know, I can trust the update and sometimes if it breaks, okay, next day there's a new one and it will fix that one breakage. That's all fine. And then everything else is an app store and you can get things from there. Um, I don't think you necessarily have to make that core OS so small. If you, let's say the GNOME, why not ship all the default apps as part of that, like Apple does it, you know, you get a shitload of applications as part of the OS update. Um, because, I mean, we are doing it well. I mean, the, those packages work in Tumbleweed. But yeah, everything that, you know, where you want to grow a community, want to pe have other people contribute, I think such an app store approach or, you know, a centralized build service where you can just get, put this stuff up and then maybe it's untrusted, but, you know, they'll take care of distributing it. Makes perfect sense. The the thought I have with that, well, kind of one of the reasons I want to, well, there's two reasons why I want to push that bar, as, make the OS part as small as possible. One is, is like the, the thing I was talking about with microOS earlier, is the, with, with, micro, with microOS being transactionally updated, you know, you, you know, any update on that OS layer, you know, is going to need a reboot, which is a bit inconvenient, plus that's your, your scope of risk. You know, that's the part where, if that goes wrong, your system's not booting, things are broken, et cetera. So with microOS, we have lots of nice features for like, automatically rolling back if stuff goes wrong. So like, with this, I would see a model where you, uh, you know, have it set up to automatically check, is GNOME booting, you know, has XDM started properly, blah, blah, blah. If it doesn't, it would be better than Tumbleweed currently is because it would auto roll back and you would be on the previous snapshot. But that means if we, if we put way too much stuff in there, like LibreOffice, for example, even though our LibreOffice package is really, really good, you know, you're increasing that risk of introducing something that's going to break in that OS update. So there's, you know, I want to minimize that risk of breakage. At the same time, the question I kind of mentioned earlier of, you know, are, are we create, is, is OpenSUSE creating more work for itself than it, you know, it needs? Do we really need to package LibreOffice? <laughs> And I know that's a controversial question. Um, and I don't, I'm not saying the answer is no, but I want to kind of use this as an, uh, as an excuse to kind of see if there is a yes to that question. You know, maybe we don't need to package LibreOffice and all these desktop apps. Maybe it's better to leave it in sort of the flat pack world and we just focus on the OS plumbing parts that, yeah where people can't, we can't trust what random upstream stuff they're giving us. Maybe. Yes, sorry. Yeah, hi, no problem. Um, what I really like about this idea is if you do a cost-benefit analysis of the amount of time that goes into integrating desktop packages currently uh, and the amount of little glitches and, and stuff you have to fix every time upstream comes with a new version, that's an incredible amount of time that's not being spent on hardening the core operating system or making that more reliable. And from a security point of view, I am incredibly in favor of sandboxing any user-facing application anyway. Um, SUSE has done brilliantly with AppArmor in the past. It's been one of the more usable hardening tools so far. 
from my point of view, if you just focus on stabling the core operating system instead of, well, in my opinion, um, misaligning time, uh, fixing glitches in the front end that will exist regardless of you patching it this round, uh, I'd be much happier, uh, especially also if you enable users to install their own apps like from Flatpak. Um, I think most here in the audience will recognize the pain in the, let's say, backside that is um, handling your mother-in-law's computer. Um, if you could give her at least a little bit of freedom herself, that saves you all those Sunday afternoon trips backwards and forwards, uh, which is also quite nice, although I even like my mother-in-law, but still. Uh, so yes, from my point of view, uh, please carry on this route. This is basically whatever made Android uh, the go-to platform uh, on mobile, uh, and even though they're doing a piss poor job at it, so please do it right. And, um, yeah, kudos for trying this. I'm uh, maybe betray being betraying my, in my ignorance about Flatpak here, but won't this end up with a lot of duplication of all your um, lib, gnome, whatever, that is then in distributed multiple times in each packs? both on disk and in RAM, or is there now some kind of deduplication? So the one reason I like Flatpak more than some of the other options, so for example, there are other options for the, the application provider, like for example, App Image, which you can actually build in OBS, which is, uh -huh. you know, sam well, can be sandboxed, or Snap, um, is Flatpak has this model of the application and its runtimes. And the idea being is there's a, a one-to-many mapping between that. So if you're building a GNOME application, it's going to require the GNOME runtime. And that GNOME runtime should be the only place where there is, for example, libgnome. Um, so you know, a runtime might require a couple of different, an application might require a couple of different runtimes. I think I think they also have runtimes requiring runtimes now, just to make things fun. Um, so it, there should be less of that duplication than you could potentially have with a containerized approach. It's still less efficient than what we're used to in the RPM world, because you're going to have, for example, um, as happens with like every major GNOME release, you know, there's there's GNOME 3.20, there's GNOME 3, uh, 3, sorry, 3.30, 3.32. You're going um, if you're using the Flatpak apps, you're you're likely to have a mix of GNOME 3.30 based apps and GNOME 3.32 based apps, so you have both runtimes, and that's, you know, compared to a typical GNOME OpenSUSE installation in Tumbleweed right now, that's like twice as much disk space. I mean, it, it's not lightweight, mm -hmm. but disk space isn't that, you know, bad. You know, isn't that, you know, isn't that expensive these days, and maybe that's a better model, at least, I mean, heck, it's what our phones are all doing already. And uh, second question. Do you have an idea how to handle um, integration where, say, for example, an application depends on some services provided by GNOME, like, I don't know, folks, or other things that are on the bus that, that they ex it expects the, the platform to provide? Flatpak has a, uh, an API for that. Its name I've conveniently just shot straight out of my head. Portals. That was it. Yeah, portals. So there's effectively portals plugged into GNOME, which provide sort of the API gateway for that kind of okay, thing. So there's cool. like the, the one that was the first, that was the, the file browser portal, because you, otherwise you'd have all of these sandbox applications, and you click on the, f you know, like, file open, and it will load up the file view of the contained application, which, of course, doesn't have any files in it, and you can't see your home directory, <laughs> and okay. that's kind of useless. So the file portal kind of gives you that, that route of, of looping through there and being able to kind of escape the container, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, the contained area for that purpose. Um, okay. it, it's, when I looked at it two years ago, it was really limiting, it was really lousy. Mm -hmm. But it, in those times since then, you know, more and more upstream developers mm -hmm. are patching their stuff already. To in, so the upstream binaries include support for those portals, and they're already okay. doing this stuff. So. They're already shipping the flat packs. And that includes things like um, the bu like D bus services that are. Yeah. yeah okay. Cool. Yeah. So that's. Hey! Imagine a staging project without LibreOffice and Firefox. How much faster they would build. It would be beneficial <laughs> to open QA developers, well, to testers, 
to have that that stuff. That that that's actually a, a, a point I I hadn't thought of. Yeah, I mean, if 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 this idea really has legs, and we really find that this is a good way of doing an OpenSUSE desktop. So, it, so we get to the point where dropping Firefox out of Tumbleweed or dropping LibreOffice out of Tumbleweed is a sensible idea. Yeah, the amount of speed we will get in Tumbleweed in, in terms of you know, development, staging, is astronomical. Um, yeah, that, yeah, that could be fun. Pardon? I'm not so big use of open source, but I mean, I have kind of radical idea. I mean, as a Java programmer, I'm always working with the Java programs and, and user, uh, users area, area where user applications running, I mean, Maybe at some point it makes sense to collaborate with other distros in producing Java-based graphical user applications where it makes sense. And otherwise, may maybe it makes sense, as you say, to drop some packages where your production will be increased, I mean, in building. Yep. So you don't want to have the overhead, but still, I mean, you, how many packages currently you packaging? Maybe more than thousands? Yeah, so in OpenSUSE right now, I think we're about 12,000 or maybe a bit higher pack packages. Um, in staging, though, do we have a... Uh, Ludwig, are you here? No. How many packages... Does anyone know how many packages are in staging? I've forgotten. Uh, so many. It, it's a couple of hundred, but it's a couple of hundred of like really big, nasty ones. Like like LibreOffice takes longer to build than like most of the rest of the distribution put together. Um, so you know, it, yeah, that's why kind of killing some, like killing, dropping some of those other packages might help. So I think this probably would make a sense, but and I don't know uh, when, when the, some com middle-sized companies kind of depending that you include some packages, maybe it's better just ask around of your, like from community make a poll to make sure that you don't drop package which kind of have critical dependency that, on the other side. That's so why I'm here. That's my point. That's why I'm repeating all this stuff. People can watch the video. The f I'm expecting the flame wars to start on the mailing list. It's all good. <laughs> you know, it's... Yeah, let's let's have that discussion. Let's see where we go with this. Like nothing's, yeah. I mean, you know, none of none of this is set in stone. I totally admit I have no idea what I'm doing. Um, so yeah, that's fine. So first of all, a bit of a radical idea on the business side. I think we may want to just ask ourselves: Is building those packages really what customers? would want to see from us, but or would the customer just be fine if he said, okay, it's built upstream, but we'll still help you if it breaks, and we'll help you through the upstream build systems and the upstream distribution. Uh, so, you know, in the end, we provide the same service. You know, be a happy camper with your LibreOffice or whatever the, the contract is. Uh, the, the other thing, um, we've mentioned it, um, like when, with the DBus interfaces and so on, the critical... Um, thing to get right really is what is the contract between the OS and the application stack um, because that's I mean if you look at the phone systems for example there's a huge API that those applications can use so they don't have to take care of any of the sensors the uh, some of the magic going on like the AI for you know voice detection and so on that's all basically a huge set of APIs that the OS provides and, and that makes the applications relatively small. I mean, they're still huge because they bundle in a lot of stuff. So that's really, if, if, if the GNOME ecosystem or whoever gets that right, uh, there's a fair chance that uh, a, a Linux desktop could be a nice platform just like iOS or, or whatever. And it could be, in many cases, just, you know, HTML5 web apps with some, you know, local storage and all, all you need is basically a Chrome runtime, yeah? So, rough show of hands, how many of you here would be interested in trying to use this if it existed? 
Cool. And how many of you are willing to help make it happen? <laughs> cool. Okay, that's fine. Cool. Okay, then. Um, does anybody have any more questions, thoughts? If not, because I'll, I'll guess I'll have to start a mailing list for, for at least you. Can we keep your hands up? Oh, this one. Sorry. Hello? Hello. Uh, okay. Um, what I'd like to say is, from a user point of view, um, what about uh, stability and uh, security of these uh, flat pack packages? That'll be something which we will have to look at. So the, the, the assumption that I'm going into with this is this is being handled by upstreams, mostly. Mm. You know, so a lot, the, the, flat, the way the flat hub ecosystem has kind of evolved, they're encouraging upstream developers to contribute directly to flat hub. So it's not like the relationship we have right now where you know, we package and you know, there's a man. It should be upstreams doing most of that in there right away. Mm. So in theory, it should be more responsive to security updates, should be you know, at, a, at a relatively good standard and relatively good quality. Um, also, if something isn't good enough, you get to moan directly to the developer, so you know, that might be a good thing. I'm not saying it's going to be better than the current. You know, that, that's, that's something this will have to find out. And, and that's actually something I worry about too, will be users' expectations with that. You know, right now, you download OpenSUSE, you know who to blame when it doesn't work. It's OpenSUSE's fault, you know, as long as you're not pulling stuff from a random OBS project. But you know, if you're pulling stuff from our main pack repos, it's our fault. With this split, how do we make sure users know who to turn to when it doesn't work? Yeah. How do we stop our bugzilla getting full of stuff about someone else's application? There is no, uh, there's also another point, and it's... Uh, I see, right now, I see uh, inexperienced users as a target, because you just have an OS, you just need to install one or two applications, and experienced users also who have their 10th or 20th device and don't want to set it up again. And <clears throat> this is something, but I, but I do not see yet uh, the way OpenSUSE is set up right now disappearing with RPMs and, and uh, having the ability to install any package you want or uninstall it again, like it's right now. I'm, so what, I'm not suggesting we change the world overnight. You know. No, no, no. <laughs> yeah. So, so you know, I, I, I can see, the, I can see the, a possible future where we start dropping packages because they don't make sense anymore. Mm -hmm. I can also see, perhaps more soon than that, a possible future where we, we could end up segmenting that kind of stuff away. Like, you know, let's imagine four or five years from now, you know, we've all come together and produced this thing and it, you know, it, it becomes more popular as a desktop than Tumbleweed or Leap as a desktop. So we, there would still be Tumbleweed and Leap and maybe there would still be Tumbleweed and Leap as a desktop, but, but the microOS desktop is you know, the big one of the family. When we reach that point, I could see us potentially doing some fancy stuff like moving those legacy desktop packages building them differently, not having them as part of staging, you know, because so, they wouldn't be a core part of the distro anymore, so, you know, yeah. therefore they wouldn't be slowing staging down, therefore we'd start getting some of those build time benefits and stuff. So, yeah, see where the road goes, but, uh, yeah, I'm not expecting this to change everything, in, in, yeah, okay. no way. I like, I like leaving Tumbleweed too much, I, you know. <laughs> How would you um, address bugs for Flatpaks? Sorry? How would you address bugs for Flatpaks for basically for the for desktop? How would you address bugs? Yeah, because it's not an open SUSE. Yeah. Now, like, I, like I said, that's kind of an open question I don't have a great answer to. I, this is what I, one of the things I would look at while we're doing this. Like, you know, it's... Um, I mean, if I remember correctly, I'm a little bit rusty with GNOME software because I uninstalled it from this machine. And yeah. Um, but if I remember right, when you have GNOME software configured with Flap Hub, um, it does have a bug reporting link in there because GNOME software is basically looking like an app store. You know, it even has kind of the whole search and stuff. Um, and when you're pulling it from our repos, 
you're getting all the RPM metadata and it's showing the bug reporting link being our bugzilla. And when you're getting it from FlatHub, I think the bug reporting link shoves it to some, I probably, probably the GitHub project for something somewhere, but so, you know, maybe it's just as simple as teaching users that's where you go to file bugs about applications. Um, maybe it's more complicated than that. Uh, yeah, don't know, but yeah. I'd, or maybe we end up doing that as a service in the sense of OpenSUSE Bugzilla models that stuff and we just have our Bugzilla sending stuff to everybody else because we know where they are. So maybe, maybe that's something the community, the, the project still does because we want to make our life easier for our users. Yeah, so the letter was really what I was thinking about, you know, basically giving the customer the same guarantee or even the community user, but not necessarily having to do it in everything at SUSE with our own built resources. Yeah. Uh, the, the other thing I think we should kind of think about is why can't we turn the layers around and say, okay, there is uh, a very stable lockdown runtime, but just like now, even on a Windows 10 desktop, you can have a full Linux subsystem. There's still uh, an RPM subsystem that you can use if you want to, and then that's a cool thing. You could have a, a Leap 15.1 subsystem, or you could have a stable subsystem uh, on, I don't know, Slash 12 that you have to pay for. Yeah, but it's, it's not necessarily bringing all those RPMs back to your platform. The platform is rock solid, locked down, and yeah, transaction update and all those things. That, that's an interesting idea. Most of the runtimes are kind of orientated to a specific desktop stack, like the Qt one and the GNOME one. They do have some runtimes for, which do get some use for like more ornate applications, <laughs> which are kind of stupid, like the free desktop runtime, which is basically like an entire distribution bundled as a runtime. Um, if, if, we, if we go down this road, which I think from the look of things, some of us are, um, and we really start getting kind of looped into this whole flatback stuff, I can see our way of thinking, meaning instead of, well, instead of in addition to like stuff like the free desktop runtime, yeah, a leap runtime and a tumbleweed runtime might make perfect sense to kind of slip in there for those non-GNOME, non-KDE, like unique weird stuff. So yeah, I, can, I could see that kind of thing falling out from, from this. Yeah. Any more questions? Yeah, Panos. I don't see that I will be a user of that. Uh, there are many points even pointed here, even from Harry's supported way, or even I don't see any point uh, having this. I mean, if I want to use a container version of something, I don't need uh, open SUSE unsupported way of doing this. Uh, what I'm thinking uh, as a use case is, speaking of myself, um, there were some times that I would like to have my development environment uh, easy, and I'm thinking if you could have, for example, a micro S, however you can call it, something that I can have in a VM somewhere in a cloud that is small enough so I don't pay much, but I can have, for example, my VS Code running there as a desktop because you're talking about micro S desktop. So I can have a remote desktop containerized in that case, which is small. So again, I don't pay much to DigitalOcean or something like that. But in the same way, it gives me a very specific thing. So do one thing and do it well. In my case, let me uh, develop Golang apps. So something lightweight, so something like, like that. So like I'm a micro S desktop with like Podman in it. Um, um, some use cases like collect feedback uh, from the com from the community in that case. So yeah, something that I can run on my Raspberry. Uh, I don't want to have petabytes of uh, different, uh, like, um, GNOME applications. I don't see any point in that, apart from um, just doing it once and then just going to the forums and saying, hey, look, I run the latest and greatest of stuff that, okay, that's it. <laughs> so... Um, I don't see the containerizing a desktop is a use case. We're not talking about containerizing the desktop, though. 
the desktop wouldn't be containerized. You know, it's going to be a traditional installation on bare metal or in a VM you know, running normally. It'll be micro OS, so read only root file system and lock down, but that's not containerized. The only containerized part potentially would be the user facing applications. So, in your case, where you want a, uh, just a development environment, well, just don't install any apps. Then you're not going to have any junk there. You know, you're going to get basically nothing more than you know, a fast booting system, because microOS boots quickly, going straight into GNOME and giving you a terminal. And then you can do all your stuff in your terminal. So if you are containerizing only the apps, meaning that they can run everywhere, then why you need an open SUSE desktop to run them? Because if we do it this way, it's the best option out there because all of our users can be really lazy. You know, they just deploy mic their microOS desktop. They never have to worry about patching it. They never have to worry about maintaining it. They just pick their apps, and it keeps on rebooting all the damn time because that's you know, basically the Linux desktop for people who don't want to have to mess around with the desktop anymore. That's the problem. It's a desktop for non-desktop users. So, cool. Uh, two minutes left. And last question. Anybody? No. Cool. Thank you. I'll post on Factory where the mailing list is going to be for this crazy idea. Then, thanks.